Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Brian Bedson of Dial Tune Drums. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Bart. Yeah, this is uh, really cool because I'm fortunate enough to say that I have been using a Dial Tune snare for the last, uh, I guess it would be about a month or so, maybe a little longer, um, that you sent me to check out. And I am just like seriously blown away by the thing. Uh, (laughs) It is so awesome. But that is very modern and we're going to go back earlier in history because uh i I think a lot of people realize that this type of uh cable drum cable tuning cable tension uh it goes back a really long time but uh maybe people think it's it's a new invention so let's educate people about the actual history of this type of tuning yeah absolutely absolutely barton um i'm glad you've had it and had a chance to play with it and uh, experience it for yourself. Um, we had a ton of fun developing this over the last several years. Um, I mean, some of it's been fun. <laughs> <laughs> some of it's been been challenging and uh, anxiety inducing and all, all of the above. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But yeah, the idea of cable tensioning, um, rope tensioning, rope tuning, you know, all these terms that we use basically to describe a drum that is uh, tensioned via some form of rope or cable is, uh, is not new in and of itself, right? I mean, and this is something that uh, when people t- look at dial tune, they encounter it for the first time. One of the biggest questions we get, I mean, on a regular basis is how has nobody thought of this before, yeah. right? Why doesn't this already exist? And, uh, and my answer often is, well, you know, it does exist. It's just that modern technology, modern materials, modern manufacturing processes have finally caught up and allowed it to function in a way um, that enhances the drumming experience rather than detracting from it. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's something interesting that we can talk about a little bit more too. But I mean, rope tune drums, basically that's where it started. Um, And you know this, you've you've hosted the Drum History Podcast. You're probably more fluent on (laughs) the history of cable tune or rope tune than, than I am. But um, when we go back and look at the history of drums, other than hitting a, a, a hollow cylinder or a shell or bone, um, the first time that humans started attaching a head to the drum, what we would consider a head today, whether that's an animal skin or some kind of thin membrane over the top of a cylinder, um, they were using ropes. They were using hide. They were using um, kind of crude twine. and You know, what's fascinating about this is that as far as I can tell in my research, this wasn't something that developed um, in one place. It it seems like it's developed parallel across culture. Um, You know, indigenous people from all over the world have these types of drums um, in their in their history. And we're using hide. We're using twine. We're using um bits of uh, whatever material they had to attach skins to a shell. And it's really fascinating to see that development. And, you know, um, some people would trace some of the the very first cable tuned or rope tuned drums to China um, way back, um, you know, AD, I think, I think 2300 AD is is what I read um, at one point. I mean, they've been around a long time. And then of course, we think about field drums. That's kind of the, where people's mind goes where my mind sure, would go. I think about cable tuning. You got that classic field drum look with the crisscrossing ropes um, going from one head to the other. And so I think as we talk about the history of cable tuning, um, the other thing I'd like to talk about in relation to what we've pursued at dial tune is, is also the history and development of the idea of single point tensioning. Yeah, that to me is what, uh, and there's another episode that'll probably be out before this one, um, with, uh, Bill Whitney of, uh, Calderwell percussion, who, who's, it's going to be a lot about, uh, rope tension, like, which, you know, before we even started this, I didn't really put those together in my mind of cable tune and rope tension. And it, it makes perfect sense, but I guess really the, you know, the, the unique thing that we're talking about in actuality is single a single point of tension um which it's very uh 
you just when I hear that, I think of, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but I think of like the technology back in the day where you'd hear about guys just you you tighten it to the point where it strips the screws, like right. it didn't catch up with um like everything you said at the beginning of this. It hadn't caught up with the actual hardware to be able to maintain this type of tension, um, which exactly which is neat. So so yeah, on that note, there then then the single point of tension. Um, what is the earliest example of, of that? That's a really good question. Um, and I think, you know, single point tension, the idea of being able to tune quote unquote, and we can talk a little bit about the difference between tuning a drum tension mm-hmm. in a drum. Um, but to apply tension to a drum head from a single point, it, in some ways it's kind of like the Holy grail of drum development. I mean, yeah. there's so many people over the years and over the decades have been after this concept because it just makes sense. You have 12 points of engagement on some, you know, snare drums with all the different lugs or down to one point. And it just, I think that's been something of a, of a challenge that, that people have tried to solve for a long, long time in, in various embodiments. Um, so we can talk about both, I think in parallel. Sure. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and cite my sources here too, cause I'm not a historian. <laughs> that's <laughs> nice. good. I'm a learner right along mm-hmm. uh, with you and your audience. I love, I love this stuff. I'm fascinated by it. Um, but I'm looking at uh, the Vienna Symphonic Library, and they have a really interesting kind of uh, concise history of drums that I found to be really interesting um, and helpful for this conversation. So, you know, talking about specifically rope tune or cable tune, and by the way, um, a little secret and and not so much a secret, but just to clarify, uh, we call dial tune, a cable tune drum. And the cable we use is actually a Kevlar braided rope. So it's actually a rope tune drum. Wow. Hmm. And we've used those words kind of interchangeably. And, uh, I think for the sake of just sticking with one term, um, we, we use the word cable. Typically a cable is made out of, metal mm-hmm. right it's uh twisted metal um and and rope is more of a synthetic material but um those two words are kind of we use them interchangeably. we started with cable uh with actual steel cable when we were prototyping and the term stuck and you know there are some other companies on the market that uh you're familiar with welsh tuning mm-hmm. systems and some of the other brands out there um, and they use an actual steel cable. Hmm. So we just kind of, we stuck with it because it was something that started to be recognized in the industry. Yeah. And um, I don't know it, it you, when you hear rope tension, if you read it, it just puts something different in your mind and, and the, the inner workings, just looking at your snare from the side where you see the, like the system where you're turning a dial to, to, to tune it, it, I don't know, cable tension feels more what it is versus like even if it is rope it definitely feels more um more like that but um yeah okay so yeah it feels a little more future forward i think yeah versus sort of yeah retro we didn't want to put that confusing piece in in people's heads too so and maybe we've made it more confusing (laughs) i don't know (laughs) no we're here to clarify but cable tune and rope tune you know we're we're kind of using those terms uh fairly interchangeably okay um during our conversation today but some of the earliest examples of sort of the field drum, marching snare, rope tune drums um, s- came out of uh, medieval Europe in the 14th century. Um, they were called tabars, mm-hmm. or tabors. I think I'm saying that correctly. Yep. And uh, you know that was the first time that that people actually attached snare wires to a drum, and often they were on the top of the head instead of the bottom. Um, but we see the example of that classic crisscross rope and it would have been animal hide um, yeah, uh, with a calf skin or sheepskin head. Now, is there a reason um, to get a little more scientific with it? I guess it, it would have to be where you'd have to do the kind of crisscross to get even tension, right? Because I guess no matter what you're doing, you need to get even tension across the drum. And I guess you just you have to do that, right? Yeah. And I think, I mean, part of it was even even beyond tension just holding the drum head to the the drum shell yeah, sure you know lug lugs had not come along yet mm-hmm. so there wasn't even really a reference or a concept for something being mounted to the center of the shell mm-hmm. um you know that was really developed later with the the invention of uh the, the tensioning screw 
and tension rods. Um, and so prior to that, it was, we just need to hold these two heads together yeah. <laughs> on the drum. Yeah. And, uh, and the best way to do that is just put a rope around, uh, between the heads and then make it as tight as you can. And, and back then it was, you know, I, I imagine a combination of twisting mm-hmm. it, um, of soaking it so that it would shrink, you know, these sorts of things. It was very limited in terms of control and what you could actually do with, uh, with evening the tension or even setting your desired pitch. Yeah, sure. um, you're kind of limited to what you were working with and, and how the head stretched and how it tanned and how it, you know, how the sun impacted it, mm-hmm. the heat impacted it, humidity. I mean, these were very, uh, you weren't, you weren't looking for a specific pitch. You were just trying to get a, <laughs> a hollow sound out of it. Yeah. Something that sounds <laughs> somewhat decent. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very, very crude, but kind of where it all, all started. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So what I'd love to, to kind of focus on is obviously that's rarely, you know, that's in that kind of rope tension world, obviously, which is great, but I'd love to hear kind of focus on the, when do we get to the, like, I almost want to call it like mad scientist, like uh, quest for incredibly unique types of tuning that like look like almost like a, like robotic if you open them on the inside, yeah. um, which obviously that's, yeah. I'm sure newer than the 1400s. So I sent you Bart, um, and this is kind of fun. I, I, I love when we did our initial patent search. Um, and of course, you know, you have an idea and the first thing is, you know, who else has thought about this and how far have they gotten yeah. in, in terms of developing it? So we do this broad patent search and we found the most fascinating contraptions. I sent you a mm-hmm. couple of pictures there so you can have reference in front of you. Yep. Um, let's just go through some Please, of these. Yeah. It is, like you said, it's almost like a, one of them looks like a medieval torture device. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, the lengths that people went to, to try and solve this single point tensioning, uh, dilemma are pretty fun. Yeah. So the first, uh, the first really interesting patent that we found during our search, um, it was developed in, or was filed in March 9th of 1858. Um, so a while back yeah. and it's a gentleman named C.M. Zimmerman, and it's the Zimmerman drum. Um, and you can see I, I sent you the drawings yep. there. But when you look at it, I mean, it at first glance, it looks like your traditional kind of Civil War era field drum. You've got the ropes that go from the bottom to the top. And you've got those little le- uh, leather straps or bands mm-hmm. that they would use to cinch the ropes um, in the middle there, tight, tight or loose, um, using that little leather strap. What's unique about Zimmerman is this is the first time that I'm aware that you see pulleys actually being applied to the system. Which pulleys, now that I see it, I'm like, boy, that seems like a really integral part of even modern systems is you have to kind of go over something like a simple machine kind of like, uh, it just seems like a, it, to this day, it's it's got to be a part of it to to make it work. So at the end of the day, you know, what dial tune is, is nothing more than a glorified uh, pulley system, right? I mean, we use rope, we use pulleys, we use a tensioner. Um, the elements that are there are nothing new in and of themselves. They've all been applied at various times and different points to, um, to drums. But really, it's a combination of those elements. It's the unique configuration, the way that they're aligned. Yeah. It's the materials that are used. It's the tolerances. Um, that that make it work or not yeah and for sure. what we discovered in our process in the prototyping process is that um if you're ever so slightly off in any one of those elements it doesn't work mm. flat out just does not it sounds bad it doesn't apply even tension mm. it doesn't work smoothly there's so many things that we had to go through and hurdles we had to overcome to take what relatively a, a very relatively simple concept and turn it into something that um that functions in a way that actually enhances this, the the playing experience rather than detracting from it. So yeah, Zimmerman's the earliest example of that kind of concept of putting a pulley on a drum. Um, and it's really interesting when I mean, you're looking at back 1858, I'm imagining these kind of pulleys were relatively, relatively new, at least in that size, you know, in that sure. style that are strong enough. And um, like Brian said, just to describe it to people and I can, I can uh, share these, um, documents in the actual show notes that uh you know you can click on in the description but basically it's you know uh i guess where the uh 
rope would go up and normally tension onto the rim or the hoop or whatever it would be there's a little pulley there where it's uh, and then at one point, which I don't really see it on this drawing, but I'm assuming it must meet somewhere where you are turning something to um, to tension it uh, and make it stay. And I'm sure that this is 1858. It probably lost its tension and you're fighting with the drum head itself. That's animal skin. Um, so great idea. But it obviously didn't revolutionize. Um, you know, it didn't stick that much. And I'm sure as the Civil War, you know, is in that kind of time frame there uh, pretty close. It probably wasn't practical to get these, you know, ten thousands of these churned out for people to use. Um, so it probably got right. it could have been just bad timing, you know, could have been bad timing. He was a little bit ahead of his time in terms of the concept. Um, but yeah, you know, I don't see and I've read through this patent, too. There's there's not actually a tensioning element. Hmm. other than those rope or those uh, leather straps oh, yeah. on the side. And that was just traditional, sure. right? That's what they had. That's what they knew. And so I guess the idea behind the pulleys was to make it a little more even. I think to your point earlier okay. about how do we, how do we adjust these ropes and make sure that it's even. And I think the pulleys were kind of his attempt to, to accomplish that, but still not single point tension. Yeah. Necessarily. Cause you're still moving the, um, God, I forget what they're called. The ears, I think, on the okay. where you move them up, the little like, uh, you know, that's how you tension a rope tension drum. So yeah, yeah, that's crazy. He doesn't have that. It's just a, uh, but the idea, the idea is there. So the idea that if we could just get a little less friction in the system, maybe you know it'll start to even out that that tone. Yes. So we give um, C M Zimmerman a. Uh, a, an A for effort, but he was missing a couple yeah. elements. I mean, for being that early, it's uh, he gets a participation award. <laughs> yeah, I love trying. it. No, it was fun to come across uh, that patent in particular. Yeah. Um, another interesting one here we have uh, is is from. I mean, we jump ahead um, significantly about sixty years. So this is January twenty fourth, uh, nineteen fifty, and this one is kind of a crazy steampunk looking yeah. collection of i mean it's like i'm just imagining the weight of all these different parts and materials inside of a drum and, and dial tunes a heavy drum but well <laughs> I imagine that yeah and this is a billy gladstone invention so it says at the top right wd gladstone um and to all right so you you have the like brain for this again for it for audio purposes what is going on here well, it took me a minute to figure that out too. And, and I've looked at this patent quite a bit. Yeah. Um, you know, essentially what we have is a fixed head. So the head is, is kind of mounted to the, the drum and I'm not even sure how it's attached. It, it may be um, clamped on or, or even, I don't know, potentially um, glued on or permanently attached mm -hmm. because you don't see there's no lugs there's no bolts there's no hoop or counter hoop um the head's just attached to the shell and then all of the the tuning or tensioning is happening internal so this whole system sits inside the drum shell mm -hmm. um and it is a complicated series of there's a there's a knob on the right hand side so you see okay we're getting a little closer here's an attempt at what I would consider a single point tuning or single point tensioning system because you have a single knob on the side of the drum. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have this lever as well. So it seems like maybe the lever and the knob have two different functions, but basically from what we can tell, and, and just to describe a little further, there's uh, what looks like a little beater head or something, almost like a, a bass drum beater at the top and the bottom yeah. uh, pressing up against the drum head from the inside. Almost, I mean, that, when you say it, sounds like a muffler, but right. I guess it's more to, like, push on it to give tension would be the idea. That's what I'm, that's what I'm gathering and, and having read through it and, and looked at it. Yeah, I think it's, the idea is those little, um, almost look like mufflers or series of, of pads mm -hmm. um, pushing up against the head. The idea is, well, if you turn the knob, 
you're pulling on these series. I mean, there's, there's chains, <laughs> <laughs> there's gears, there's rope, there's all these different things that kind of work in concert, I guess. Yeah. Um, together to apply pressure from the inside of the drum against that drum head, which would change the tension. Yeah. Um, but I imagine you're also like, to your point, going to get a, a significant muffling effect too. I don't, I don't know that this would have sounded very good. And then I, I'm just the rattling and the everything else going on with all that hardware. Yeah. I can see why this didn't really ever take off. No. And, um, you know, I'm also curious and you probably know about it too, about, um, I've seen one in person, but there's the, um, I'm trying to find the, a picture of the inside and how it works, but very, I think it's right in the, the fifties, which kind of, when I think of the fifties, I think of like, I think of this type of like exploring phase and, um, and maybe even before that they had the single, like only the top head is tunable, the bottom or tack head. Right. So it's like, right. it's like, it's evolved into like, you know, uh, you don't get to tune at all. It's tacked on. You get to, t- you get to tune the top head. Okay, you can tune the bottom head. Um, okay, we're gonna coast through with World War II. Okay, we're in the fifties. Let's go <laughs> nuts here and like right. experiment. And then in the fifties, I know there's also um the knob tension, like Leedy had one, which yep. would have been George Way, which I don't want to get ahead or whatever, but it seems simultaneous to like that it would be Gladstone and George Way. Uh I'm sure other people too, but th- those are the big like mad scientist kind of guys exactly and uh and then a little bit later we have arbiter yes and so that's one that we can talk about as well and same thing going after how do we tension this thing from a single point yeah um and then it's worth talking about why those systems did or did not take off and some of them had yeah a decent following in their day and then just faded and, and some of it was more internal stuff um to the company and, and some of it was just it never really took off with the, uh, with the customers. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, it is fascinating. The fifties are that sort of golden era of you know companies had a little bit more money in their pockets. Uh, manufacturing processes had really come a long way post war. Yeah, um, and so that was a good time for people to just try stuff. Uh, now, do you know? So while we're on that fifties with the Gladstone, um, and then I guess a little bit on the knob tension. Do you know, was the knob tension leady stuff? Did you research that at all? Is that a similar um, type of system? I've never opened one and seen it, but I would imagine it's got sort of a, a similar um, system of tension. Yeah. And so, I mean, Bart, yeah, your, your point about leady um, and kind of that that time frame as well. Compared to something like this Gladstone, I mean, obviously... Um, it was a lot more streamlined. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was a lot closer to something that would actually be really functional and usable. Um, I've never held one of the Leedy systems in my hand, but I, I know people who've played them and said that they actually they worked pretty well, yeah. um, especially initially. Uh, but maybe they weren't they weren't built to last, or they just because it was a new concept, it was sort of still in that, that developmental phase and and had some bugs that needed to be worked out. Um, but the idea then going towards how can we sort of build the tension system into the hoop? So mm-hmm. well, right with Gladstone, you see it's all internal to the drum and the emphasis is on the system taking place inside the drum itself. Yeah. Um, and you've got kind of the beginnings of some sort of chains or cables or ropes being used. Um, yeah. Where Leedy is much more focused on how do we, how do we adjust it at the hoop? Uh-huh. Uh, but from a single point. Yeah. And, from what I've seen and just kind of uh, I've saw I saw one in person at the Chicago show two years ago or whenever that was the last time uh, people saw each other. And it uh, I guess it's different, too, because I believe it's still like almost like an internal lug. Like it was like it was like knob tension for each point of tension around the drum. So it's not technically, I guess, a single tension. It's more of a it would be knob tension, but there's multiple knobs around the drum mm. So Got that it, is yeah. different, I guess, than than what we're what we're talking about, but sort of the same in in theory. It's a, another step in that yeah, direction for sure. Um, and I think I think we mentioned Arbiter a second yeah. ago, and Arbiter would be the next step, mm-hmm. even after Leedy getting closer and closer to single point. Because with Arbiter, um, you actually had a single point tension. Um, and Arbiter came out of England. Um, 
Ivar Arbiter um, was the, the kind of founder who brought these drums to popularity. And they, they were actually quite popular um, for a period of time. You can still find them um, secondhand. And I know a couple guys that own them. And I think, you know, basically, um, best way to describe Arbiter, if you haven't seen one, is it's you have your hoop and then you have uh, another adjustable hoop that that's kind of on a clamp system that clamps around the internal hoop that sits on top of the drum head. And, uh, you know, the best way to I guess to describe it is you turn a, a screw on one side of this, uh, adjustable clamp hmm. that as you turn it, it, it pushes, it, it closes the clamp tighter and tighter, but the way that it's designed to rest on the internal hoop is that it actually pulls down simultaneously. It's kind of a unique and, and really ingenious, uh, idea and system. Yeah. Um, kind of, reverse of what you think like pulling down like the pushing up and the as opposed to like you think of just like always pulling down and and tensioning um right yeah yeah it's kind of counterintuitive um yeah and and it seemed to work pretty well uh i i think that there's obviously some limitations in terms of um how quickly you can do it and and i think it can be a little bit of a struggle to get the thing on and off yeah, I mean, it, it's a cool idea. And I should say, too, that Ivor Arbiter is, is also kind of famous for um, he's claimed with uh, designing the original Drop T Beatles logo, um, which is really cool. That has nothing to do with what we're Super talking about, cool. but because he founded Drum City um, and he's come up in, in a couple uh, episodes about British drums. And um, so when was the Arbiter? When was its like time frame? Yeah, so Arbiter was 60s, it looks like. Okay. That's cool. That's very cool. It, uh, from what I've seen, and it's probably more in, in England, um, they still are around and they're still pretty available yeah. and they're not that expensive. I mean, yeah, and I'm sure they're still pretty cool to experiment with and, and mess around with. Yeah, they're neat drums, you know, and I think, um, Arbiter probably faced just with that product in, in, in particular, uh, some of the challenges that we found, you know, in launching, in launching dial tune. And that's that, and I'm, I'm guilty of this. I'm a drummer. I'm, I'm a traditionalist, right? Like I was the last person in my high school to get a cell phone. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> if it's not broke, don't fix yep. it. Like I, I drive an old truck, yep. stick shift, like just keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate things. And so, you know, we found that introducing something new, a new concept to the drum community is a challenge because mm -hmm. you're met with skepticism, yep. you know? And I think most people at NAM, that was our experience. They walk by the booth, they kind of look at it and It'd be curious, and and if you could get them into the booth, and then uh, hey man, I know it looks like a lot. It's really different. Just give it a try. <laughs> yes. Just play it. Yeah, and you'd see the light bulb moment. The face would light up, jaw would drop, and it was just like, oh my gosh, you have to experience it to believe it. But yeah. we're skeptics. Oh yeah, I want to. When we get to the today with you guys, I, I want to talk about that too because I got some comments from people that were like that about, um. Oh, hey, here's a cool video that'll show you how to tune a drum. And I'm like, it's not that I don't know how to tune a drum. You know what <laughs> right. I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's a different thing, but we'll get there. This episode is brought to you by Dream Symbols. I want to talk a little bit about the Dream Symbols Recycling Program. The recycling program is simple. Bring your broken or unwanted symbols, all brands accepted, into your local Dream Dealer, and you can earn $1 for every inch of symbol you bring in towards the purchase of a new Dream Symbol. For example, bring in two 20-inch symbols for recycling and receive $40 off the price of a new Dream symbol. It's that easy. They, in turn, take the symbols recycled and use them to create new products like the ReFX Crop Circles and the Naughty Saucers. Check them out online at dreamsymbols.com and follow them on social media at Dream Symbols. We've got another patent picture here. So where, where do we go from there? I, I believe we've got another kind of tension uh, to jump ahead to, right? Yeah, and so this one was fun. Another one that we kind of dug up during our patent search, um, 1965, and it's actually it's not even related to to drums uh, specifically. It's a it's a banjo head tightener. Hmm. So, um, you know, most of us are familiar with banjos and how they actually have a, a drum body that you tune or tension. And uh, someone set out this guy J A O Sloan. Um, decided he was going to make that process a little bit easier and a little bit more simple. And so when you look at it, I mean, 
the first thing that jumps to mind when I'm looking at this picture is like Rototom. Exactly. Um, it's got a really similar look, similar internal kind of frame mechanism on it. Uh, you twist it to, to tension it. Um, but as you can see, also it uses this series of cables and it almost looks like a, a bike tire, right? Yes. It's like these spokes, spokes of the wheel that are these ropes or cables that go into this, uh, a kind of a take up spool in the middle. So a little bit of a hybrid between what we would consider when we think about Rototom and, uh, and sort of a cable tensioning system. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. You know, like it's crazy that I've never really, uh, First off, I think maybe in general, the Rototom doesn't get enough credit. I think everyone loves the Rototom, sure. but like most people have a set of Rototoms sitting around and like uh, you just rarely use them that much. I mean, they're really cool. You set them up, you pull them out, you use them. Okay, that's awesome. But as a type of tension, I mean, that never even occurred to me that that really is a uh, single point of tension. I mean, you're just you're turning. It's genius, really. You're, you're twisting, you're twisting it. and it's, it's a brilliant concept. Um, to your point, right? Rototoms are really great for what they are and for what you would use them for. Uh, but they're a little bit just limited to that. Mm -hmm. Um, another great example of this, this, uh, rotating concept for single point tensioning is of course, Furchi. Hmm. And if you're familiar, are you familiar with no. Furchi snares mm -mm. at all? So Furchi is a fun one. And actually I, I was on their website this morning, looking at them again, they just relaunched, um, which is really interesting. And they were kind of came to fruition, I think in the, you know, early to mid nineties or early two thousands is when it first sort of showed up on the scene. Hmm. Um, they had a couple bigger name drummers that were kind of promoting them a little bit and talking about them. Um, and it's a really interesting concept. It's, it's built in. So it's an all in one system, uh, that's really unique to their drum. They have their own proprietary shells that have more of a, a cone shape to them. They're not, they're not so cylindrical in sort of a typical shell fashion. They kind of taper towards the top. So almost more shaped like a, um, yeah, like a cone or like yeah. a, a short sort of volcano. Yeah. These are <laughs> shape. pretty wild looking. They're pretty wild. And then uh, you have you have rods um, that you attach the, the top drum head to, and they have um, tension rods on them. Hmm. So you do set the initial tuning with those rods. And then uh, and then to tighten it, you just you rotate it. So there's that rototom kind of experience of spinning the drum yeah. to change the, the tension or the pitch on the top head. Wow. Um, it's really fun. It's an interesting concept. Um, I've seen them. I've heard them. They, they sound pretty good. I mean, they're, they're very much a unique sound and they're very much, um, limited to what they are, that shell and that material. Um, yeah, man, it's, it's, um, it's definitely very unique looking. I mean, really it looks, I mean, these are really cool looking drums, but it, it, it looks straight up like a road, like a roto tom frame. I mean, it, Right. probably is what it is uh, i would imagine for like right. at least the prototype but um there's something to be said about like very unique looking drums a snare drum which is like that's like our bread and butter where with dial tune with you guys what i think is really cool is it looks obviously it's got the knobs on the side but it looks like a regular snare for for, for yeah. the most part whereas this is like very unique the furchy i mean which which sometimes people maybe wouldn't want to have a really crazy unique standout snare drum, even if it's really nice and cool to tension it like that. But um, because these are these are pretty uh pretty far out. It says they're made in New York, which is cool. I'm surprised I've never heard of that. It's unbelievable that this this far <laughs> in the show there's so much more to learn. Yeah, we came across these uh, like I said a couple of years ago, and then uh, it looked like the company had closed, and I just saw that they it looks like they just relaunched. Their website says. Uh, Hmm. Yeah, copyright 2021. Um and you know, I think part of it is it's still it's going after that same concept of how do we quickly adjust pitch? How do we get a sound, a specific sound in a short amount of time um in a certain situation and and do that with ease? And of course, one of the limitations I think about the Furchie drum is it it's only dealing with the top head. Mm -hmm. Oh. So you're not you're not really adjusting that interplay or that relationship between the top and bottom heads. Um, 
But to your point about our drum looking like a snare drum, you know, that was something that uh, was critical to us. We're trying to we're trying to move the craft forward, but we're also trying to respect and honor the history and the process yeah. of drums. We love drums. I, I have so many drums with tension rods. I'm not getting rid of yeah. any of them. <laughs> I'll keep them. I'll use them. I'll play them. And and you know, and I think that that's something that again, with sort of the drummer mentality of being a tr- being traditionalists and being sort of really proud and protective of the heritage of drums. Uh, we get pushback sometimes. People are like, well, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to rewrite the game? Are you trying to get rid of tension rods? I said, no. You know, ultimately, what we're trying to do is create a compelling alternative um, to the traditional system, which we still love and use every day. Yeah. So tension rods work. They're not broken. What we're doing is we're creating something that, uh, that still sounds like a snare drum, looks like a snare drum, plays like a snare drum, uh, but offers some unique advantages, uh, especially in given situations like session work. Mm-hmm recording you know and we'll talk a little bit more about the the purpose behind it and the problems that we're trying to solve but, but yeah we're not trying to cancel one out in, in favor of another we're just trying to create an alternative and that's kind of what Furchie looks like as well it's a unique alternative it's almost its own classification of instrument yeah uh to some extent yeah it really is yeah it's kind of like the uh electric car where people are like well you're trying to get rid of my gas you're trying to get rid of my car and it's like well no it's just a different uh <laughs> sort of different mode different mode no one's <laughs> yeah. taking your car <laughs> we actually right we actually compared a lot to uh to the automatic transmission mm-hmm. um you know i mean i still drive a stick shift like i said there's some advantages to that uh but you look at what automatic transmissions have done for the auto industry and uh the convenience and some of the other factors there it's not a perfect comparison because yeah i really enjoy manual yeah stick shift is more fun <laughs> For sure, more fun. Yeah, where I would I would argue that actually I think dial tune can be more fun sometimes. That's than true. Traditional tension rods, but yeah, uh, but yeah, it's kind of that that mindset. We would love it to be ultimately the vision for dial tune is to see it as an option um, on any kit, on any size, on any style of drum that you would purchase. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. So as we're getting closer to like modern, uh, you guys dial tune. Anything else in the history portion that we should cover that you've, uh, you know, cool stuff you've come across? Yeah, there's a couple things that have happened more recently. Um, there's a, a company called Page Drums that did some cool rope tuning drums, uh, and, and they were using pulleys, um, so pulley and rope. And it, it has that, again, that traditional crisscross pattern, but it's just a bit of a modernized version of that field drum. Mm. Uh, look to it and and they were uh i'm not sure if they're still in existence um but they're they were building drums you know 10 or so years ago and you can find their kits floating around too and they if you're into vintage or retro kind of throwback stuff they they can be pretty cool Cool. be a fun collector yeah kit to have um and then of course uh uh welsh tuning Mm -hmm. is the other in the cable tuning, um, more modern cable tuning uh, range that, that, you know, they came out, I think they were at NAM. We were at NAM in 2017 with a really rough prototype and we can get into some of the history of dial tune. You'll hear more of that story, sure. but we had a, basically a proof of concept and it looked very different from what we have in front of us today. But, um, we did our, our kind of demo and, and showed it off and we got feedback and we took notes from all the drummers that we encountered at NAM and just really wanted to make sure that we were doing something that was going to benefit the drumming community. And again, like prototyping is, is expensive. R and D is, is expensive. It's, it's time consuming. It costs a lot of money. And so in time and effort. So we wanted to make sure that if we were going to commit to this, that it was really what drummers wanted. Yeah. And so, uh, getting that feedback was super valuable, but we were there in 2017. And then I think we took 2018 off to, to R and D and well showed up in 2018. That's when we first saw them. And I think that's when they launched, um, and again, looking at Welsh, it's kind of basically looks like the page drum, but with cables, steel cables, pulleys, and a single point tensioning. That's when you actually get, you know, another company that's using a single point of, of tension using a, a worm gear mechanism to tighten the cables. Now, again, the distinguishing factor between Welsh and our system currently is that their cable runs from head to head. And so it tunes both heads simultaneously um, as well, similar to the old field drums. Cool. 
You know, I got to say, too, that I think it's cool you are bringing that up because I've had lots of episodes where people will, will literally not mutter the name of a competitor. <laughs> um, so it's cool that you are doing that because in anything in life, there's going to be other companies doing something similar, um, which, you know, whatever that it, it, it happens. Just you, you should be able to stand alone on your your great idea and your great system and quality. So um you know, that's cool. Well, and, and look, you know, we, I've met Sam. He's a great guy. Um, you know, the music industry in, industry is small. And when you're at NAM, you run into people and, and it was fun to talk to him because, uh, the way that he kind of developed his concept, um, I think we're, we're very like-minded mm-hmm. <laughs> people and, uh, he's, he's just a down to earth likable dude. And, and so, yeah, it's, we're competitors in the sense that we both have a product in the cable tuning space. Um, but it's also unique enough and distinguished enough that they're they're two very different systems yeah. um, trying to accomplish a similar you know outcome for a drummer. But uh, I think there's enough nuance to to allow for both to exist at this point. So yeah, yeah. Um, and it draws attention to cable tuning, which is really kind of beneficial. I think mutually. Yeah, exactly. Where you know it's uh they definitely are different um the the wts drums and dial tune um which is welch tuning systems um but you know um and i guess the biggest obstacle at this point would be getting people to you know i don't want to say convert it's not like again we're trying to take it away but it's getting people to be comfortable with it so um all right so as we're now kind of at that more modern time and we can talk about dial tune um so you said that you really, though, your like finished product, final drum shipping is is really pretty recent, right? Within the last year or two, we launched officially our product in uh, in January of 2020. Man, well, <laughs> so bad timing for obvious. I mean, it's great timing, but the, the whole world shutting down is not. Yeah, no one wants that. But I mean, I feel like. You know, you're either going to buy one or you're not, whether whether it's coronavirus or, or anything. So uh. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we uh, we were at this in terms of development. Um, we've been at it for a long time. Um, you know, we were my very first NAM show was uh, 2016 mm-hmm. Summer NAM. And we went there with a, a prototype that. Didn't work, frankly, it was. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we ended up shelving it, and we just stood at the booth. Uh, my friend Alexander, one of the co-founders, and I, and handed out three by five cards with a render on it, asking people what they thought of the idea. Oh, cool! I mean, that's where we were. It was yeah. like we showed up. <laughs> we had uh, we had spent a bunch of money on this uh, R and D um, product manufacturing company to help us kind of take my original concept and, and bring it across the line. And long story short, they just, they dropped the ball big time mm. and did not deliver. We ended up getting a box of parts that did not fit together that we were trying to make work the night before the oh show. Oh my God. Wow. It, it was, it was a nightmare. And, uh, and we just said, look, are, are we showing up tomorrow? Empty handed? Like, what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and we ended up going and, and just passing out cards and asking people what they thought of the concept. And, and of course the, Number one question is, well, where is it? Yeah, I'll, I'll check it out. <laughs> where is it? Yeah, I'd love to get my hands on it. <laughs> but, you know, what's interesting was uh, the feedback that we got and the enthusiasm about the initial idea was so strong and so overwhelming that that just was the fuel to the fire that we needed to keep going yeah. um, and to take the next step and the next risk. And and so, yeah, to back up a little bit, um, Dial Tune was something that, that really was born out of... Uh, an idea, inspiration I had in, you know, um, in college, actually, when I was uh, well, just graduated college, I graduated in 2009. So you talked about, you know, 2020, kind of a tricky time to launch a product. Yeah. Um, also not great in two, 2008, 2009. 2009 was a tough time to, you know, to, to graduate yeah. and, and expect to step into to the world. And, and, you know, you're young and starry eyed and um, I'm not here to, you know, to speak poorly on education, I think it's a wonderful thing and a great privilege and opportunity to have gone to college. Mm-hmm. But you kind of had this expectation coming out the door, like, "Yeah, I've got a degree now. Like, I'm going to be hired and start working." And yeah, 2009. That was that was a tricky time to step out into the world. Much like I'm sure a lot of uh, young people are feeling today sure. as they're graduating and seeing kind of the economic climate we're in. Yeah. So, um, 
so personally it was it was an interesting time i i um i felt like an adult and yeah i found myself moving back home with my parents and sleeping in my old bedroom like so many of us <laughs> yep. were at that time yep. and parking cars as a valet to try and make as much money as i could uh, um you know uh part time and, yep. and the beauty of that was it gave me a lot of time um to to think and to you know I'm, i've always been someone that that uh as a problem solver and a tinkerer, you know, um, I used to rebuild motorcycles in my garage, my parents' garage. And, um, uh, so I've always been fascinated by how things work. Uh, I was also a drummer. And, and so this, this kind of idea of single point tension, this idea of how can I, how can I take something in, and, and, so, and, you know, I, I think if I can apply myself to this, there's gotta be a way, there's gotta be a way to make a drum that's super versatile that could quickly adapt to any environment that we're in um, and, you know, and, and can make head changes a snap. And yeah, it's not that I, I didn't know how to tune and like, to your point, I think we all learn the process yeah, sure. um, and there can even be some pleasure in it and it can be an enjoyable thing. Uh, but in certain scenarios, I, I was playing at the time um, in a, in kind of a traveling uh, church band and we'd go and play it different churches that had uh, a need, maybe their, their main um, worship director was out of town or something, or they didn't have a regular team that, that would lead. And mm-hmm. so we'd just go and show up and volunteer time to play. And so I was always in these um, various settings of, you know, acoustic were terrible. The drum set was held together with duct tape and I'd bring my snare drum and I bring my cymbal bag. And, uh, and it was such a challenge to go in these environments and make my s- snare sound like, anything workable yeah you know and i was always tweaking and adjusting and throwing the moon gel on Mm -hmm. taking it off and putting towels over it and doing all the things you do and so with all my spare time when i was you know at home or working at at the ballet stand on a slow day i'd I'd just have a little notebook and i'd be writing and um sketching and yeah just trying to figure it out that's awesome i was a valet as well uh oh you were yeah, i was a valet and i had a period where i was like i'm gonna get into mo i had i loved mo- i love motorcycles i sold one my last one when i got a kid uh when i had yeah. a kid but um it was just like i'm gonna learn how to do this and i just screwed a few things up and i was like i am not this is not my i'll ride them but i won't work on them but um yeah i mean that's uh that's cool that you I don't want to say you saw a problem but there was a uh there was something that could be done better um it's not replacing it, the, the right. traditional, you know, uh, you know, way to tune drums, but it's definitely different. And I don't want to say again, it's better or worse, but, um, I guess maybe now I could, you know, uh, talk about my experience with it because yeah. it is all right. So, um, I'd seen them, I'd heard of you guys and I thought to myself, I mean, it's, and I'm going to speak, uh, obviously, you know, we've talked for a little bit, but speaking fully like transparent as a person, as a guy who'd never really played one before, I thought, Oh, that's really cool. I never really thought I'd even be able to try one unless it was at Nam or something. And even then you're like, sure. You know, you hit it a few times. Uh, I like most people probably think, okay, I don't have that much of a problem with like, you know, quickly kind of tuning up and down. Um, and my, I guess in 2020, 2021, um, main use for that I or my main drumming career was in session work at the studio where I work so they'd call me and say hey you know you're the guy who works here so just come down and play the drums even in 2020 but uh people who listen to the show know this I tore my Achilles tendon in October so I was actually out for a while but anyway so uh when you hit me up I was like yeah that'd be great I'd love to try it I didn't really know what to expect about like um just, I didn't know what to expect. I had no idea how easy it would be, how, you know, like how necessary it is. So right when you hit me up, I started to get these like, Hey, can you, are you okay? Is your foot or leg okay to play drums again? And I was like, I had no idea, but I said, yes, assuming that I'd be fine. (laughs) Um, so anyway, we, we, uh, I did, it, it got here the day before I got book to do one of these sessions, which are, they're for like commercial. There's a couple different ones. I used it for three sessions. Uh, first one is for like a commercial, uh, or no, I should say first one is for like a corporate 
client, very corporate Pe- you people will probably never hear the songs, but they're very, very high, uh, level company where they're paying a lot of money for these songs to use for their whatever internal sure. use or whatever. So, um, and, uh, I bring the drum and I'll tell you, I brought an acrylite with me as well. Cause I didn't know yeah. what to expect. I was like, I don't know yeah. if I can use this thing. If it's going to, if I'm going <laughs> to like mess it up with no experience, I got it the day before yep. took it out of the box. Um, I don't even have, I have an electric kit set up at home. Uh, I moved somewhat recently, so I don't even have a full kit set up here, but so I bring it, um, throw it on. And within like a couple seconds, I was like. Uh, this is awesome. Like, okay, I can totally, you know, go up, go down. Um, I put a little moon gel on it, obviously like any snare where you take out some of the, the ring, especially if you're recording. Um, yep. And another interesting thing that I was, uh, explaining to you before we started is now when you do a lot of sessions for these commercial kind of corporate clients is there's a link, it's like a listen to, uh, sort of thing where like, um, it's an invite for anyone on the team of like this corporate uh, marketing company where they can click on it. They can listen sitting at their desk, doing whatever, writing, you know, marketing materials. They can listen to the recording session that's going on for their music that's getting done. Uh, in COVID, wow. it happened a lot because it's like, hey, we can't have you into the studio, but you can hear us mixing uh, in the background. Anyway. No pressure, no pressure. But but really, the beauty of it is, is like, hey, can you uh, let's try a lower snare instead of having, you know, multiple different snares. It was just a quick right. bottom head, top head. Let's go lower, go higher. OK, cool. And um, it was just awesome. So the first time I used it was on that session. Um, and and I should say that, obviously, this is totally just personal, like my experience. You're not like sponsoring the podcast or anything i'm giving you full on like this is what happened just so people know that um so we did that uh the engineer was like losing his mind over it adam plyman loved it uh, who i work with all the time uh i was absolutely sold the next week i had to do another one which is for a uh like a jingle that'll be on the radio and tv in 48 different markets around the country cool. which is pretty cool yeah. so i can't it's for a window company i guess i i could say who it is but i won't um uh so second time we did it same thing a little bit of moon gel went up went down um let's do a fat snare on 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 this version uh and then snares off and everything was just awesome and i shot a um in one of those days i shot like a video of myself which i put up on facebook and i guess i should probably put it up on youtube but showing me doing it like a little demo video um which people liked but it's interesting because a lot of the comments were um you know a lot of people said i'm really curious about this i've always been curious about it wow looks awesome looks super easy um but there are people who say um well, I have no problem tuning my drums. I don't need this. Sure. I have, you know, it's like defensive. Um, sure. Yep. We get that. So what do you <laughs> say to those people? Like, what would you say to like, you know, I don't need this thing. I'm, I'm great at tuning my drums. What's the answer to that? Yeah. I mean, what I say is you're, you're probably right. You don't need it. There's a lot of things in life we don't, we don't need. Um, and you might not be the customer for it. I mean, for us, we we built it as a labor of love and we built it to solve maybe like to your point, maybe not a problem, but to enhance mm-hmm. a certain element of our playing experience. Uh, for us, it's a, it's a gateway to creativity because it allows you to adjust in seconds on the fly to tailor your sound immediately to whatever environment, whatever track, whatever you know, musical expression you're, you're engaging with. Um, so as a tool, I think it does have a lot of value and a lot of uses you found in the studio. Yes. I'd say 70 to 80% of our customers right now are studios. It's home studios. Yeah. So perfect yeah. for that. I mean, I, I, so live, it would be great too. Like you said before, it is a heavy drum. Right. I mean, it is a, not that like you think like, okay, like usually you bring to a show symbols, stick bag and a snare, which like, Okay, the snare weighs. I mean, how much does it weigh? Do you, I'm sure you know. It's about it's a little over 20 pounds. Okay. So it's it's not light. I mean, it, you imagine um, if you're used to lugging around a uh, a bell bronze or mm-hmm. some kind of forged yeah. <laughs> metal drum, you'll be comfortable. Keplinger, you'll be comfortable with it. Yeah. 
Uh, but if you're not, if you're used to a standard 12 pound drum, then it's double that it's heavy. Yeah. So, but I mean, again, if it's sitting on a snare stand and it's basically, um, not replacing the fun of having a bunch of different snares to try, but in those situations where it is like, it's not even like a, uh, I'm playing on a rock album and I'm going to use my supraphonic. I'm going to use this for these vibes. These are like commercial corporate songs like even like a, the radio jingle right. it's like they don't care like they didn't it, it isn't like that crazy of like use a dynasonic on this one now it's like no just can you make it sound higher can you make it sound lower yep <laughs> um, yep absolutely perfect for that so my recommendation would be for everyone that it's you know and it's not a cheap drum at all but it's right. it's replacing that like studio you need to use a bunch of different things um yeah, I just loved it. We've had we've had customers sell multiple drums uh, to purchase this one because of the versatility. So versatility is the name of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, the user friendliness, the ability to adjust both heads independently quickly, yeah. because that's something else that's really unique to this drum. Is yes, you can tune your bottom head on a traditional snare, but you got to take it off the stand. Yep. And so with this drum, the the ability to tune your bottom head without even removing the drum off the stand just gives you that even added. Uh, yeah layer of flexibility while you're playing and we found i've learned a ton about tuning through engaging with this process obviously but because um because i'm able to so quickly play with that relationship between the heads Mm -hmm. i've learned a vast amount of information about how that works and how they interact and and, you know stuff that would have taken me hours and hours and hours and hours on a traditional drum yeah Um, so that's a fun part of it too i just think i think they're fun to play that's another piece is just the pleasure of playing and being able to quickly adjust your sounds yeah is uh can be a blast i felt that same thing where i was like uh, i mean i've always done i mean again playing for a long time it's like you know okay let me tighten the bottom and maybe i'm being lazy but i'm like okay if the drum sounds good to me it's like i'm not going to touch it for the next like six months or something like i'll i'll tighten the top head a little bit i'll loosen it i'll do the like one yep one tension rod totally loose and then that like those techniques but um yep yeah it's fun to experiment with it and i haven't changed a head on it obviously because i kind of have a demo version so i'm not switching heads out but um well do what you want yeah well <laughs> try it out it's actually fun to compare heads too so quickly yeah that's something too where i'm like you know normally you have to take it off and and what you said before about switching drums and taking the you know or switching the drum and uh you know tensioning the bottom head differently when you are all mic'd up and you're in yeah. there and it's set it really slows things down to be moving the SM 57 or whatever's on your snare and then right. pull it up and then you bumped the bottom and mic and then it's like, Oh my God. <laughs> right. And, and, and to the snare head changing point, you know, um, a lot of our studio guys, they're used to bring multiple snares. Now they bring multiple heads. So uh, they have five to 10 heads and that's a whole color palette. Right. So yeah. if it's a heavyweight, it's a single ply. I mean, that changes the whole dynamic, the whole voice of the drum in about 30 seconds. And so that's kind of where this has shifted a lot of the way that they engage with studio work is they just bring heads versus sure. drums. And that that's been a benefit to a lot of guys. Yeah. Okay. So I had the, uh, six and a half by 14 maple, right? There's other ones, yes. right? There's an acrylic. Why don't you tell us about the, the, what people can get? Yeah. So right now our, our sizes are all six and a half by 14. Um, that's just how we designed mm-hmm. the initial system. We have plans to roll out a whole bunch of different depths and diameters down the road. We'd love to do a full kit, you know, but yeah. like I said, we just launched last January. Um, so we do, uh, the maple, which is Templi. We do an Acrolyte. Um, and those are RCI shells, the same shells that, you know, you find on all the other big brands that do Acrolyte. It's a great drum, kind of that standard crisp, dry Acrolyte mm-hmm. kind of boxy sound. Uh, and then we do a, a 1.2 millimeter uh, nickel over brass, which is my personal favorite. Mm. Uh, it's a beautiful sound. It cuts through in the studio like none other. It's kind of our our ode to the Black Beauty, yeah. um, all the dial tune. <laughs> uh, and then we do uh, one fun collaboration drum right now uh, that's a made to order thing. And we work with uh, Cade over at Savage Drums. I don't know if you're familiar with Savage. I feel like I've seen, it on social, seen them on yeah. social media and stuff. Yeah. Out of Bellingham, Washington. Mm. And so he makes, uh, they do the cast uh, bell bronze, four millimeter, um, similar to what your your old Tama bell bronze Mm -hmm. shells would be, very similar profile. Um, And that thing's a beast. I mean, you think the standard one's heavy. That one's, you know, a (laughs) a good 15 pounds more. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) You almost need to sell a wheelbarrow with it. Yeah. Um, But it's a monster and it sounds 
unreal. Uh, and so we do those made to order and we've actually sold a, a fair number of them. We just launched that, um, in February. So it's been fun. That's awesome. It's, it's so cool that it's like a system that works on a drum that sounds good. It's not a drum that sounds good, but it's losing its tension every time I hit it, or it's not a, right. uh, you know, a system that is really keeping its tension, but it's on like a whatever generic bland snare. I mean, it's, uh, Yep. It's all really cool. Well, that's, a th- that's a good point, Barton. That's something that when we set out to create this, there were a couple non-negotiables. We had to be able to tune both heads independently. That was just a non-negotiable. Mm-hmm. It had to sound good all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like non-negotiable. Um, the tension had to be uh, even or even enough to produce a high quality sound. Yeah. Um, and then we didn't want to sacrifice the other aspects of the playing experience to go after this one element. Cause like going back to the patents we looked at earlier, uh, Zimmerman and, and some of the others mm-hmm. where you have, you have a solution, but even in that solution, sometimes it's creating other problems or other variables that didn't exist. So you solve one thing and then you create 10 other issues yeah. that get in the way of the drummer's experience and playing the drum. And at the end of the day, if it's not enhancing a drummer's experience, it's not worth it. Yeah. Um, so we were really committed to that, that it was a drum that we would play. It's a drum that we would um, enjoy playing and not get frustrated with that worked well all the time. So, yeah, yeah I, I appreciate you bringing that that point up that, you know, sometimes innovation can be clumsy and it can actually detract. Yeah. And we really wanted to make sure that it was something that enhanced. Yeah, it feels feels fully realized, um, looks beautiful. Uh, it seems like all the, you know, the generations before of this technology have kind of it's I mean, it's 2021. We live in a time of like, you know, you sh- it should be you. I feel like you don't find systems like this that come to market where it's, you know, you're buying it and you're paying like a thousand dollars for it, where it, it feels like it's a amazing finished product. Um, so congratulations. I mean, seriously. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to say a lot about this today, but we have a whole future sort of product roadmap too. Um, and you mentioned it's, you know, it's 2021. So, uh, one of the ideas that we have a patent on is, is how we automate it. So, you know, you got a single point tensioner now, mm. which allows you to do a lot of things. Yeah. Um, and so for studio use and that kind of thing, I mean, imagine presettings that's, and all the rest. Okay. So just, just to kind of open that box a little bit. Yeah. And that's one thing where, uh, Adam, who's the engineer who I work with all the time, he, he was like, okay, can, if we change it, can you get back to that same sound? And I right. was using like, there's like a little, I, I think it's, I'm assuming it's for like a, for if you want to take the side casing off, it was like a little Allen wrench kind of hole. And I was like, okay, I can remember where I had that little marker. And I guess you could even right. take like, put a little piece of tape and then remember full turn or quarter turn. So remembering your, like, like you said, memory, you know, presets would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in in the pipe in the pipeline, <laughs> that's great, man. Okay, well, um, where can people find you? Why don't you give that information here as we kind of wrap up and uh, you know tell them about best place to find a dial tune? Are they in stores? Is it directly through you guys? All that good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, right now we sell direct to consumer online through our website, and it's uh, dial tune drums one word dot com. So dial tune drums dot com, um, and you can purchase directly through the site. And we typically ship within one to three business days. Um, we have, to your point earlier about, you know, wondering where you could get your hands on one to try it. Cause that's a big thing. I mean, you're, it's a significant amount of money. You're committing to a purchase. Mm-hmm. You've never seen the drum. You've never heard the drum. So we offer a 90 day money back guarantee. And part of that is to allow people the experience of purchasing it, trying it out, making sure it works for them. Yeah. And then uh, if they love it. And most people do, they, they keep it. And if, uh, if for any reason you want to send it back, we honor that for 90 days. Um, we are in a, a handful of select stores. There's, uh, in, in Washington state, West coast drums, um, over in Bellevue. Um, there's a couple of shops in California and, and we're working on, uh, setting up larger distribution, but the best place right now, if you just want to go direct to our website, you can learn all about it. There's videos on there. Uh, reviews, testimonials, and you can kind of learn anything you want to know. We're also really committed to customer service and being really responsive via email, text. There's a chat chat function on our website. So if you're curious, if you have doubts, if you're a skeptic, we love it. Bring it on. We'll we'll have that dialogue. We want to, um, 
yeah, just in, engage with your curiosity around it. And um, again, we're not trying to to make converts. We're not saying throw out all your old stuff, <laughs> but we do want to offer a compelling alternative and kind of a new uh, a new expression of of the instruments that we love and play. Yeah, on a daily basis. So awesome. Cool. Well, um, this has been great. Um, and Brian is, uh, been kind enough to hang out for another couple minutes. I hope that's still okay, Brian. Um, I'd love to hear when we do the little Patreon bonus episode about, uh, you know, the world of the internet is full of haters and people who are skeptics. So maybe we can talk a little bit about things that you've questions you've faced from some of these people, which we've kind of gone through, but things like that. And then maybe we can talk a little bit about, um, you know, the sourcing of these, it's not super like the materials and stuff. I mean, I don't know your full background, but it's, it's, it's a, I mean, it's, you're manufacturing this drum. So maybe we can dig a little deeper into the actual manufacturing process and yeah, how they absolutely. go from, you know, the idea to a finished product. So, um, cool. Well, if you want to hear that, then go to uh, drumhistorypodcast.com and there's a little Patreon button and you can join up and, uh, for, you know, as low as two bucks a month, you can get these bonus episodes. So yeah. All right. On that note, um, Brian, give them the, the dial tune website one more time and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. Yeah, absolutely. So it's dial tune drums.com dial tune drums with an S.com. Cool. Awesome. Well, Brian, I, uh, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge and experiences and all this cool stuff. And I absolutely love the drum and, uh, I, I have one more session that's going to coming up in the next couple of days and I'm hoping I can keep it for. <laughs> then, uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Hang on to it. No, it's been a blast and thanks for having us on. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at drum history and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future until next time. Keep on learning. <laughs>